All right. I guess you would have got a notification now. Yeah. Awesome. And it looks like you can share my screen. Sure. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a. Uh, it's really. I. Um, believe it or not, I actually got uh, started on my one of my first forays into entrepreneurship was as it was at a BPEP talk uh, back in 2018. Uh, right after my you know, we, in, in my PhD, we started discovering these, getting these really neat results. And I, as the kind of the first stop on my entrepreneurship journey was a BPEP talk on how to turn your technology into, into a, an actual company. And that actually really was what got me headed down that direction. So um, it's, it's actually quite an honor uh, and a real pleasure to get to give back to the system that uh, I really saw as, as a huge in, uh, inspiration when I was getting started on my journey. So uh, yeah, by introduction, I am Marco. I'm the CEO of Catena Biosciences. Uh, Gio Guillen, my co-founder, is actually uh, on the call here, um, but I believe he'll be having dinner during this time. Um, and so we, we really came out of my research at Berkeley. I was a PhD student between Matt Francis and Jennifer Doudna uh, and had the pleasure of seeing you know, a mammoth and scribe come out of Jennifer's lab in the time I was doing my PhD. And uh, I got to be in Matt's lab when he became the chair of the Department of Chemistry. And so it was a really interesting time. Um, and so the, uh, the thing about being in, you know, these, these kind of labs is that they're, the, the thing that I realized is that PhD training is incredibly good at teaching you about failure but it's not so good at teaching you how to start a company. And so when I first started getting kind of exposed to this idea of entrepreneurship, I knew that I needed to really start exploring the, the resources that Berkeley had to offer. So uh, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about uh, sort of my personal uh, company here, just to let you know, give you a little bit of background on the basic, basic overview of what we do. Uh, and then I'll dive into a little bit more on the, of the journey that I took to get there. So for us, our technology is one that lets us glue proteins together. And this actually is really important because the biotech revolution, how we, you know, the, the way that we make new therapies started uh, with Genentech being able to economically produce insulin. But I'd argue that the more significant advance was uh, Amgen's release of Enbro, which is a fusion therapy that has two different proteins that are just attached together using DNA, and then they're expressed as a single protein therapeutic. And that idea really inspired me and motivated me for a lot of my PhD is this idea that you can take two completely different uh, entities and fuse them into a single therapeutic molecule and create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And that was really motivating for me. And the thing that I realized during my PhD was that our tools for make for doing that, for sticking different biomolecules together are really quite bad. Um, and so in my PhD, when I when we found this cool coupling technology, uh, it really it, it really was an, an aha moment, you know, that that second where you you when you so personally have understood and, and struggled with a problem and then you find the solution for it. Um, it's, it's this really beautiful moment. And it was, that was really the time when I realized that I was, that this was something special. Um, and so at the heart of what we do, um, we, they, we use an enzyme that activates native, native amino acids, and we're, it lets us make a bond between two native amino acids. And that's, that's really it. That's the secret sauce behind this company is this ability to just glue proteins together and proteins on the surface of cells. And there's a lot we can do with that. And I'm, I'm happy to talk with you all uh, later in the talk if, if you want to know about what we're planning to do with this. But I think uh, my goal for this talk was to really dive through that, that journey from idea to getting the company off the ground. Because uh, I think that that's uh, that that's what was most relevant for me at the time, and I think that's that's the stage you all are at now. And so, this 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 idea of this company of fusing proteins together um, obviously didn't come to me fully formed. Uh, we the this was literally the first piece of data here uh, that 
told me that I had something cool. And this looks like crap. It is not good data. This is from a mass spectrum device. Um, we literally uh, just, I, someone in the lab, uh, Matt, Jonathan Maza uh, in the Francis lab had found this enzyme. And he said, look, I'm doing some cool things with it. We can attach it to some unnatural amino acids. Uh, you have Cas9 because you're working in Jennifer's lab. Let's just throw it at Cas9 and see what happens. And again, this is pretty messy data. It's actually, uh, I'm not proud of this mass spectrum. But the one thing that was very clear from it was that this uh, here is the mass of Cas9, you know, the, the CRISPR protein. And this is the mass uh, of double what we were hoping to stick to it. We, 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 we just, you know, we, we threw these things into a beaker together and we just said, let's see what happens. And we got this double addition and that was completely opposite of what we were expecting. And it, it actually, it turns out what we were seeing was previously we'd seen that we could attach in some cases to the N terminus of proteins. Again, all of this, it doesn't really matter the specifics, but basically we were expecting one thing. Um, and instead we were getting twice the modification that we were expecting. And that's because what we'd uncovered was this pathway that was not what we had expected in the original science, but it was this ability to create the bond between tyrosines and cysteines. Originally, it had been between tyrosines and amines or N-termini, um, but it's the tyrosine-cysteine bond that actually is the most efficient and the most stable of the things you can form with this reaction. And so this data that looked that, that at first we were really upset about it because we're like, why is it, why is it doubly modifying? Why are we getting two modifications every time we run it? Um, it actually ended up being the piece that unlocked the, this idea and the knowledge of how, of, of that we were actually doing a different type of bond formation. And that was in fact the moment where I realized, no, we actually have something really special here. And so this, it, it took me about, six months from getting this data before I really decided, no, this is, this is something worth forming a company. And it took me about nine months, I'd say, uh, to actually take, get the gut, you know, build up the, the courage to talk to the other researchers in the Francis lab who'd been working on developing this reaction with me. Um, and I, you know, I said, look, I, I think we have something really cool here. I think this is worth trying to turn into a company. Um, is anyone interested in doing it with me? And uh, the everyone that was working on this project at the time didn't want to leave academia. They they all said no. I, I I'm happy on my academic track, or this seems too risky. This is way too you know too much of a crapshoot. Uh, I don't think this is something that I want to do. And so, um, and so I I I talked to uh, my PI Matt Francis, and he said, well. I've been burned before on startups, but you know what? Why not? Let's give it a shot. <laughs> um, and and so we we decided to start, you know, exploring what we could do with this. Uh, for me, it was a a bit of a no brainer. Um, I, I knew that academia, the the, the pursuit of the the faculty position. Uh, for me was not something I wanted to be to go through. Uh, I, I think by the time by the end of my PhD, I'd been involved in enough of the faculty searches that I'd seen all of the trials and tribulations and the somewhat fickle nature of that. And it, it was it was very clear I didn't want to join go into academia. And then I also kept going to these, you know, presentations by Merck, by Genentech, and just really not being inspired by the job descriptions of, of people that were entering into those companies, you know, with at the PhD or postdoc level. And so, for me, this 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 became an obvious thing. This this was this was a technology that let us solve a problem that I had personally experienced in my PhD, and I had understood very well the limitations of the current state of the art. And with this new solution, it it was too useful to not do something with. Um, and so, as I said, uh, the first thing I did when I started, you know, thinking, oh, I might want to start a company is I went to some BPEP uh, meetings and then I really got, you know, inspired by what other people were doing and other people's stories. And then I said, well, I really need to know how to run a company uh, if I'm going to do this. And I decided to take uh, the entrepreneurship class uh, at the Haas School of Business. And that is where I met. Geo, my co-founder. Uh, literally the first day in class, I sat down 
And this guy sitting behind me, I started talking with him about, you know, oh, I've got this like, crazy idea. I have no idea if it's, you know, if, if it's even like commercially viable. And I have no idea if anyone in this business class is going to understand what I want to do with it. But Geo and Geo comes from a software background. He's not a scientist by training, but he is a phenomenal product manager and a phenomenal um, just operations guy. I mean, he, 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 he does everything in our company and, and really makes it run. And it was amazing talking with somebody and just like me venting like my crazy theories on what we can do with this thing and uh, having someone to reflect off of them where you can't just spiral off into the, the vagaries of, of um, science really helped ground me and helped me, forced me to be very precise and focused when I described my science, which also very much molded my thinking around it. And it really helped to clarify our application of this technology. Uh, and so Gio and I went through that class together. It really helped to build trust between the two of us. Uh, we got to experience working together and know that it would work well. And then after the class ended, uh, we kept working on building the company. Um, I've got a slide here that's kind of the timeline um, for, for you know, building this company. And so uh, January 20, so 2017 was the first data that we got, uh, just showing that tyrosinase modified cysteine residues. Um, then, you know, had some work with my undergrad where that kept building this uh, momentum. Uh, in January of 2020, that's when I met Geo in that entrepreneurship class. Um, we, uh, February 2020, we were, you know, the class left us to move forward. We got the Haas Seed Award, was our first funding uh, at Katena. Um, that was only $5,000. But that really let us build out the the, the necessary pieces, right? Like the, the most important thing coming out of your of your research is if you've done, if, if you want to take some science you've developed in your academic work into a company, the most important thing, of course, is making sure that you can secure that IP. And so what that $5,000 did was it let us get the letter agreement from Berkeley. It only costs $500 and that gives you six months of protection of your IP um, that no one else can license it during that time. And that's, that's really important as you're trying to get investors on board. And you can keep extending those six months over and over again, just by paying another $500, um, unless you know the university gets sick of you or someone else really comes calling and it doesn't seem like you're going anywhere. Um, of course, to do that, you have to file uh, a patent for your work. That's uh, the beautiful thing about Berkeley is they have a really easy system for doing it. I literally turned in a, a draft of a paper that was about five pages long. And in a couple of weeks, uh, Berkeley's lawyers came, came back with a hundred page uh, um, patent application. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable what they can do with it. And it's, it's really not hard to protect your IP. Obviously, you have to submit that. Um, you, you have to turn in that paper before you publish it anywhere. Once you've published it, it's public knowledge and it can no longer be patented. And so that's just an important step to make sure you keep track of. And so, you know, we, we, we got this seed fund in June, uh, but we, there, was, uh, there, there was actually a scenario where Berkeley had some potential interest from another company in licensing that IP. And so it took us until November, um, of 2020 to get the go ahead from Berkeley. They said, look, we, we've cleared that, that uh, conflict. The IP is yours to license. And so we incorporated that day and then we're able to sign that letter agreement, getting protection for our uh, IP or the, the, the patent that I had filed during my PhD. And so only a month later, I finished the PhD at Berkeley. So we, we, we were incorporating this company right as I was finishing up, like writing my dissertation. It was a really crazy time. Uh, and, uh, and so I finished in December. And so in 2021, the first couple months of the year, we're just desperately trying to get funding because I no longer had the nice academic cushy position to do. I Thankfully, Matt Francis was uh, a very kind mentor and allowed me to work as a postdoc for two months there, give me a little bit of funding. So I wasn't completely burning out my bank account, but it was definitely a stressful time. Um, I think for me, the hardest piece uh, as you're trying to start a company is it is not obvious how you take an idea 
and builds, turn it into something that is actually worth money to someone. And that is the most, that's the most challenging part of this whole journey, I'd say, is that process of transformation from just a, a simple scientific result to an actual business plan that's going to make you money. Um, classes like the entrepreneurship class really help with it. Um, and I've got um, a, a slide and a website that lists a ton of resources. Um, there's, of course, um, Darren's going to talk about the iCourse program later on tonight. There's a lot of resources at Berkeley to help you build out these ideas in a safe space. But the challenge is for me that I just, I, I couldn't just self-fund for that entire time. And so it was very important for us to get funding in fairly short order. And so in those four months between December and April, uh, our business plan changed dozens of times. Uh, we, 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 we refined it. We kept, we kept remade our, our pitch deck, I, I think over 20 times in those four months. Um, we talked to everybody that we could. Uh, and then on April 1st, uh, which really did feel like it was uh, a joke, we got into Y Combinator, uh, which is uh, more famous for the software side of things. Their, their deep tech um, is only just starting to you know, explode. They've, they've gotten a lot of uh, biotech companies through their track in recent years. Uh, and so they accepted us, which for us was huge because we went from having $5,000 to $125,000 overnight. And that's a, that's a huge, huge difference. And it, it, you know, that really gave us the confidence that, oh no, we're going to um, be all right here. The other thing that I'd say is that, and that I think is perhaps underappreciated for those types of incubators um, is that the knowledge that in three, you know, in five months, we were going to be going through this Y Combinator demo day and our valuation was then going to, you know, increase even more. That actually was the trigger that caused many of the VCs that we talked to to decide that, oh no, now is the time to invest. We'd spoken with a ton of VCs, but it was only after we got into Y Combinator that they decided, no, this is actually something we want to invest in. And so we went from having a lot of kind of non-committal answers to suddenly three or four VCs all trying to convince us that they we should let them invest, which is a great feeling and it happens rarely, but when it does, it's a really great opportunity. Uh, and so we were able to get an addi some additional funding uh, from venture capital. Uh, Social Impact was the uh, firm that, that eventually gave us the majority of our kind of pre-seed funding. Uh, biotech and any, any hard deep tech company is expensive to launch. And so we took on about $500,000 uh, to actually get the technology going. And so the, the thing that was most... Um, interesting was then we had to build the company. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we set up our, our lab space uh, in Berkeley. There's uh, an incubator that now is closed where, but now we're, we've moved to Baker Labs, which is, or Bacar Labs, which is right next to campus and affiliated with the Bacar Fellows Program. Uh, and so we, we, we got into there, we start, and then in just two months, really, uh, we, were, we launched our first mouse trial um, and which, which showed that we were actually able to impact autoimmune diseases in mice, which is what we've been hoping to do. Um, and then in very short order, we then had our demo day for White Combinator. We got it, we hired our first full-time scientist uh, and licensed the technology from Berkeley, um, which was really exciting. And the other thing that was really uh, exciting and kept us motivated is, um, Back in, oh, where was it? I think it's uh, June, no, August uh, of 2020. We had our first meeting with uh, a major pharma company and they said, oh, this seems kind of interesting. Keep us posted. And so we, we kept talking to them throughout this whole process. Um, and they, they, they expressed a lot of interest in working with us. And so that was something that was really good is we already had some amount of market validation. Uh, going into this, it was just a question of could we build the company in a way that would actually be able to accommodate that. And so we, uh, in, in September of 2021, almost a year after we'd first talked to this pharma company, we were able to launch a research agreement, um, starting to build out some of this technology. 
And then, you know, later in the fall, we hired our second and third employee. Uh, and now we've just moved into a new space and we're working to actually close our seed round, which is really exciting. And so all this is to say that it has been in a very, very lot of, of progress in a very short amount of time. In about 12 months, we went from having just incorporated and having no funding to now, you know, basically we're, we're on the cusp of closing our, our seed round, which uh, is pretty exciting. And so it is remarkable how fast things can go once you step out of academia. And it's remarkable how daunting that can feel. I think for me, the the biggest step is finding someone to do it with. I, I, I don't think that this was is something that I would have enjoyed doing on my own if it had been only me doing it. Having Geo on board has really made the, the hard parts easier to bear and made the good parts feel that much sweeter. You know, having someone to share it with is a really important piece. And I think that as scientists, we often underestimate how important it is to bring diverse skill sets into companies. I, I, I know a lot of people really, and I, frankly, when I was you know looking for a co-founder, I thought, oh, I need another PhD or someone who, who can understand the science on a deep level. Uh, but I, I really do have to say having someone who understands the business side um, has been instrumental for us as we build this company um, and, and really just strongly advocate that for anyone who's looking at this to look at some MBAs for, for your co-founders here. Um, and so, so let's, uh, let's dive a little bit more into that, you know, key catalytic process, right, between finishing up your academic work and then launching the, the, the startup company. Uh, as I said, it was a lot of iterations on this basic pitch deck that we developed. We just over and over got in front of people uh, and tried telling them, you know, here's what we're trying to do. And they say, oh, this is terrible. You need to fix this, that, this, you know, slides one through 20 are all bad. Here's how you should fix them. And uh, ultimately that's the only way to get better is uh, it's, it's iteration. It's, it's the process of failure. Just like we set up experiments and test hypotheses and try and get new data, presenting your pitch deck to people and getting their response is the same thing. And it really is possible to be scientific about this approach. Uh, and so that, that for me was, uh, a really, that, that was something I didn't expect to get out of that period, but it really is a scientific process, right? You're, you're testing a hypothesis and then you're iterating on it and you keep modifying your reaction conditions and that's how you get better. That's how you ultimately figure out the right way of doing things. And to be honest, it took us a long time to get there. Um, you know, even after we got went through Y Combinator, I, I would argue that we still fundamentally did not have an amazing uh, grasp of what we needed to truly raise the, the seed round that we've, that we've been trying to raise. It took us from September to, you know, basically through this new year. I mean, it's, it's taken us over, yeah. Six, it's taken over six months, almost seven months to, to really figure out what we actually need to be telling people that in order to raise that money. And I think that that is an important piece that for me, again, I didn't expect to be the biggest challenge there, but it is, it is very hard to build out the knowledge base that you need to actually commercialize a scientific product. It's not just understanding the science. It's not just understanding the market. It's really being able to lay out a step-by-step -step plan and convince people that you are going to be able to take their money and with the science that you've developed, turn that money into more money and the steps that you're going to get there to build the value. Um, and so the, let's see, the, the, the thing that surprised me the most about this, as I said, is really the how simplified you need to get with with your science. Um, I've, I've had to become very comfortable with reducing the science to the point that I think past me, you know, my, my, my grad school self would really feel like I was uh, committing lies of omission. But ultimately, I think that's the greatest skill you can develop if you're planning to 
build a company out of your uh, out of your research is get used to simplifying it down to its very most simple distilled bits and talk to as many people as you can so that you can actually have a, a good basis for building out that company and, and, a, and a good sample size to justify the decisions that you're making there. For us, the other most important piece is that I didn't mention in this uh, kind of timeline is bringing on advisors. We really benefited from the phenomenal advisors that exist around Berkeley and beyond. Um, there's, there's, it, it sounds trite and everyone talks about, oh, our advisors are so great and they help so much. Um, and I, I, I also, I underestimated how exactly how valuable good advisors can be. Um, it's not just someone to tell you when you're being dumb. It's someone that uh, is there to stand up for you and, and introduce you to people and say, no, no, you need to pay attention when these people are talking to you because they've actually got something special. Uh, finding that person that's willing to do that for you is such a huge asset. Uh, and it's, it's something that for us has really been the deciding factor in a lot of these early conversations. Um, let's see, things I wouldn't do. Um, I, I, I would say the number one challenge for us uh, was trying to raise more money before we were ready to. Uh, we, we, we went through Y Combinator and that you know, at that point, you're introduced to a ton of venture capital, you know, VCs. And that's, you, you think, okay, I've got to raise money now that I'm being introduced to all these people. And we had really just, it had only been four months since we uh, raised our first round. And we hadn't really gotten anywhere uh, terribly far with our data in that time. And so I think very rightly, people said, well, what's new what, like what what's changed what what's what's made it worth investing more money in this company uh, and i think that's the most important thing is that even if you have an opportunity to talk to venture capital it doesn't always mean that you should or it doesn't mean that you should be talking to them in a pitching capacity there's informational discussions are always something you can do and that's never uh, i would say it's i rarely felt like it was harmful to us to talk to venture capital in an informal setting but if you do a formal pitch and they don't like it, that's a very different type of scenario. And so the best thing you can do is have informal discussions if you're not ready. And then you can show them in a couple of months, look at how far we've come from where we last talked. Now you should give me some money. And so I think that was, I'd say for me, the biggest learning that I got from that period. Um, yeah. And so that's that's you know kind of the, 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 the broad story here for Katena. Um, what I've got, I do have, uh, if anyone, if we like, um, <laughs> I can show you what our first pitch deck looked like compared to what the kind of modern iteration of it is, just to kind of walk you through just how much things have changed for us. Uh, and so this this was the what, what I pitched uh, January of 2020 in that entrepreneurship class. Um, so I, you know, I said I was gonna target antibodies. Um, and this was the graphic that I used to convey this. Uh, I talked about how antibodies can do things and antigens attached to antibodies can give you targeting. Uh, and if we can label cancer cells, then we can use these modified antibodies to kill them. It's, it's actually pretty embarrassing showing this, but I think it's important to show people how far you can come and how, how much you adapt uh, in a short period of time. Um, and so, you know, we'd be able to kill cancer cells with those ant uh, modified antibodies. Um, and so, you know, I had some little bit of market analysis, et cetera, uh, and some, you know, graphs with go, go trending upwards. Uh, and this, this was, this is my pitch. This was, this was very seriously like what I took and what I showed to Geo. Um, and for some reason he was like, no, this guy probably knows what he's talking about. Like, I think this is worth joining on. I have no idea why this is again, um, pretty, pretty, uh, basic technology, you know, like just like I said, it's embarrassing now looking back on it, but I think it's, it's you have to start somewhere and it, you know, getting to this stuff on paper is really the most important first step. Um, and now we've, you know, iterated on this. And so now we have much cleaner slides, much cleaner ideas of what we're trying to communicate. We talk about, oh yes, we're gonna, this is how we're gonna scale the reaction. These are the reasons that it's scalable. These are the reasons why that's important to industry. And, you know, we, we, we've got a much more refined presentation style. We've got a much better way that we communicate how we're doing things. Um, 
And, and it's, you know, the, the content is not necessarily less dense, but the way that we present it and the value points that we say that we're, that we're hitting, the things that we pick out, that's what's changed. And so this, this is now the modern deck, right? So this is, this is the way that we now present our science. Okay, we've got the ability to modify cells. Here's the different types of cells we can modify. Um, and here's why we think this is important. Um, and, you know, we talk about, you know, oh, yeah, so this is, this is this autoimmune thing that we can treat. Here's some data. I, I won't take you and bore you by going through the whole deck, but basically it, it, it's remarkable uh, what a little bit of time and some very cheap uh, design uh, aids can do. Um, there, there's a lot of design companies that will just for a couple hundred dollars um, spruce up your deck and just really can improve the design uh, tremendously. We, we really benefit from that. Uh, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll stop there for a moment, uh, and uh, we can we can start going into a little more of an informal chat or Q and A session if anyone uh, has any questions. Marco, thank you so much. Uh, this is what we call learning in the open, and thank you for sharing those lessons. Like, I love that timeline. Uh, if if I may, I'd love to jump in and like engage and you know dive into some of the pieces that you presented. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you mentioned is about getting it, getting all the information about the idea on a piece of paper. How important is that? Like, it just gives you clarity. It, it gives you clarity of how much you don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, so that, that's, that's just the beginning point. But let's go back all the way back uh, into your lab. When you started talking to your lab mates about a startup, dig deeper into that conversation. Like, what was that conversation like? Like, uh, who did you approach and say like, and what was your opening statement and, and how did it get shut down? And how do you take notes to answer and survive? And you're doing great, phenomenal progress. You know, it, it looks like a long time for people, but you know what you did and from your PhD days to now, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, no, it, it really has been a phenomenal. Um, so that conversation, um, so I, I, as I said, I, I, I went to BPEP presentations. I, I took some, I even, you know, audited some classes, but I, I hadn't really committed until uh, fall of 2019. And then I, I, I took everyone that had worked on the project. I wanted to make sure that, you know, and that's the most important thing, right? You want to make sure that no one, if you are going to take research out of the lab, you need to make sure that everyone is involved in that discussion because otherwise you get the kind of backstabbing, people feeling like they, they didn't get the opportunity or that you stole their research. Uh, and that's not, never what you want. Um, and so I, I gathered everybody that had worked on the project together into a room. And I said, look, I, I, I really think that there's A, that we have something special here and B, that we should can and should turn it into a company. Uh, and, and the answers I got were, um, I think that is too risky. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the risk. I want to, I want something that's more of a sure bet for my next step in my career. Uh, I'm not, I, I want to go into academia, so I don't want to risk my academic pursuit by being affiliated with a company at this stage of my career. Um, or just this, this is, I don't want to keep doing science, uh, was, was honestly like that, that was, that was another couple of people from the lab. And so, that was hard. Uh, you know, it, it sucks when you're like, I think this is going to be great. And everyone's like, well, I don't really want to do this right now. Um, I, I, I do think, I think the biggest factor for most people is the, is what I was most afraid about when I was, you know, thinking about launching a company was I, for me, I don't know about if anyone else has this same experience, but for me, I had this like, all right, there's this, there's a scientific result and there's a black box. And on the other side of it, there's a company that has stocks and employees and a lab space. And that black box was just so foreign and scary to me. Um, but I was excited. I, I, I always knew that I was something I wanted to dive into, but I understand how a lot of those, my lab mates, just that uncertainty about what the steps would be to get there is enough to just say, well, that's that's too much uncertainty for me. And I, I understand that. I understand that perspective. And I, but I, I really do think that it is laughable to me that people that go through a PhD feel like starting a company is too obtuse or, or, or too confusing of a process. I mean, like PhDs are infinitely more complicated. There's so many different things you have to navigate and weird dynamics and there is no roadmap for the PhD. So starting a company is, 
I would say it's not easier, but it is in no way harder than finding your way through a PhD program, I think. See, I, I think that that's uncertainty is very understandable. One of the reasons is a lack of stories like yeah. yourself. They have seen a lot of become, people become professors uh, or people go into yeah. industry. That's a more you know well-paved path. And I don't think we hear too many stories in academia. First of all, thank you again for telling your story, right? Uh, okay, uh, going from there and you go into this Haas class and meet Gio. Uh, I, I don't know if Gio is around. I would love to bring him onto this conversation and say like, what did you, what are you thinking? <laughs> this guy is talking, you, you're coming from a, a software background and this guy is talking about antigens and antibodies. Like what, what, what triggered that flame? Uh, that you decided that you're going to travel this journey with him. And, and what, what is that you mentioned about trust? What was that trust building exercise like? And how long did you guys take to build that trust and get comfortable and say like, it's like dating somebody that you yeah. want to marry, uh, that you decide like, okay, I want to go with it. I, I, if you can go back to your timeline, it just felt like it was so fast. Yeah. Uh, Gio, you want to you wanna dive in yeah. there? Yeah, so it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Um, so yes, I was that MBA student. I was at Google and Facebook before, and I really wasn't happy with what I was doing in my life. I really wanted to go to business school to start my own company. And in this class, you know, it was pitch day. And in this class, you come up with an idea and you pitch it to the class and on the entrepreneurship course. And if the whole class votes for your idea, you get to build it out for the entire semester, as Marco has probably already alluded to. So I was trying to build a, a virtual reality interviewing platform and Marco was developing a protein conjugation platform. 100%, the first time I heard it, completely different industry, completely different world. I didn't even register what protein conjugation could potentially mean in the industry. But what I did latch on to is he did talk about the areas this could bring in an impact. He said oncology, autoimmune disorders, vaccine development, and I latched on to autoimmune disorders because it's something that I suffer with personally in my own life. So I immediately knew this was that opportunity. I was like, this is it. This is, this is why I went to business school to work on a problem. I told myself before I business school, I said, you're going to come out of business school. You're going to work on one of two things. You're going to work on a product that's either going to help humanity or the planet. And here was the perfect opportunity for humanity. So it was, it literally was the perfect opportunity. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but the next day I was like, Hey, Marco, let's go have lunch. And I pitched him. I said, you don't need another PhD founder. And I respect all of you on this call, right? All of you are very technical founders, but I think, I think the beauty of why Katena has fueled so fast of a growth is because we do like delineate responsibilities. We do have clear different skill sets that we bring together, right? And we can communicate that fundamental science to, to where investors can understand it. And that's the biggest hurdle that I've seen tons of brilliant scientists encounter. Um, for me, it, that trust took months, right? Early on, you know, he's trying to gauge whether or not I can comprehend the technology, whether I can understand the potential, right? And I'm trying to, I'm trying to gauge him. Is, is he a good leader, right? Is he someone I can follow for years to come? Because it's my career on the line as well, right? So, so it took months uh, to gain that trust. But once we gained it, him and I are in lockstep. Like we know, like we don't even have to ask questions anymore. We just know that we need to fire in all cylinders. I take care of this. He takes care of that. But it's literally like hand in hand. It's, it's a beautiful thing once you find the right co-founders. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I, for me, I really, really have to say like Geo was in 110% from day one. And that was ultimately for me, the thing that I, I just needed, right? Like I had the experience of presenting to my fellow grad students and postdocs and they said, eh. and so here having somebody who said, no, I, I believe in this and I want to be a part of it. Um, that, that means a lot, right? The, the thing about, um, we, 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 we've had a phenomenal week and I, unfortunately I can't tell you all about exactly what makes this week so great, but we've had a really good two weeks here. And the thing is, is that the last two weeks, came about not because I there was any one moment of like phenomenal brilliance that we had. It was because it's been the last 12 months of constantly chipping away at this thing. And that's, that's the thing is it's just 
it's not any one giant step that you take. It's just someone who's willing to be there and keep chipping away with you day after day, month after month. Um, and then eventually you get this massive, you know, it, 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 it all starts kind of falling into place, but it, having someone that's willing to be there when it looks like you're not making any progress at all for months at a time, that is just, that, that's really what for me was an ob- made it obvious that this was the right partnership to be going into. Great. Thank you, Gia and Marco for that plugin. And like, I'm numbering the lessons we learned. Number one, write down to get some clarity. Number two, get used to no's. <laughs> Uh, it, it, there'll be a lot of notes in your startup journey. Number three, try to find a co-founder like Gio in this case, who you can completely trust on. It, it's a hard, hard pathway. Uh, and and having having somebody who can listen to your stories is great. Uh, I just want to take a, a different uh, a step here. Uh, incubators, you know, it, it has become a natural step for you to, you know, once you start a company, you want to go to an incubator or an accelerator. Walk us through the process, like, you know, how many are, accelerators, incubators did you consider? Why did you end up taking Y Combinator? And what are the major lessons learned in terms of good and bad too? Yeah. Um, so we we did, we, we looked at a lot of uh, accelerators and incubators. Um, we know we, we, we have Citrus Foundry here at Berkeley, which is completely free. Um, and I, I really think that it, we didn't fully understand what the different incubators brought with them. And I think that was the, the, a big challenge for us. Um, early on, we desperately needed any funding because you know, I was, I was you know, quickly running out of the time that Matt was willing to fund me as a postdoc, which was about two months total. Um, and then Gio was uh, on the cusp of deciding if he wanted to take an, uh, an internship with Facebook or <laughs> keep working on this crazy company idea. And so we really needed to know that there was something in the bank that we could actually, you know, pay ourselves a tiny bit out of so that we weren't just going and draining the bank account. And so for us, we were very actively looking at incubators and accelerators that gave some funding because that at least meant that we'd be able to keep this thing going over the summer. And then that gave us more runways, more time to convince VCs and to build up this storyline that this is a company worth doing. Again, the cool thing about some of those accelerators is that they do catapult your value and make you much more attractive because people know that once you get into them, in you know, whenever that program finishes, you're about to be pitched, you're about to be pitching to thousands of VCs at once. And so you're going to be getting money. They have to get in now if they want to get in early and for the for cheap. Um, I put post in the chat some of the uh, free mentoring resources that we've also found because I think there's there's two very different purposes to these accelerators, right? The ones that give you money are there to move you forward rapidly and to get you ready to help kind of polish you off and then put you in front of a bunch of investors. The ones that are there to give you free mentorship, on the other hand, are there to help you build your company, build your ideas, refine things in a, on a more fundamental way. And, and they're, they're there to help you build your network and to really get introduced to advisors that are likely to be able to support your company in the long term. And so it's two very different purposes. Uh, and so I, I think it's just important to know what you're going in for when you're looking, because like we were just looking at all uh, incubators as kind of like just as one class of experience. And that really isn't the case, right? The ones that give you money are there to accelerate you, move you forward rapidly, and then get you in front of investors. The mentorship mentoring programs like the Skydeck Hot Desk that doesn't take equity in the company, like Creative Destruction Lab, like um, the California Life Sciences FAST program, they are specifically there because their job is to pair you with people who have been through this, who are in the industry and want to give back, want to help out new companies because they want to give back to the community. And it's a, just a, it's a very different experience. And so I would say that you can never do too many of the free mentoring programs. You're, you're getting introduced to people who are there for the right reasons. They want to help you out. They want to give you good advice. Um, we've had amazing experiences with every, all of the ones that I've listed. Um, 
the accelerator programs are great because you get a lot of validation. Being in them is prestigious and exciting. Um, it's hard because as I said, we weren't ready to start pitching when we finished that program. It, the timing just wasn't right, quite right for us. And so we weren't able to leverage or, and utilize the momentum that we got coming off of that program to raise our fund at the time that that, that you know, when that, the, the, the demo day happened. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a timer, right? you right? You, 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 by going into one of those programs, you then start a clock and you better be ready by the time it ends or else you're really not gonna be able to capture some of the value of that experience. I'd say we still got a lot out of it. It's still, it was still a benefit to us and it, it allowed us to raise that first fund uh, much more rapidly than we would have otherwise. But I definitely think that I would have done that a little bit differently uh, or like deferred. You can often in times wait to the next cycle to present your company in their demo day. We definitely should have done that in our case. And that's a, I, that's a, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to add one last quick thing. You know, as, as potential new founders, right, one of the things you have to decide is, is which accelerator is right for you, which one has the right advisors, the right networks, et cetera. And um, there is a... a an East Coast and a West Coast way of building biotech companies, right? There is the East Coast way where it's, you know, people who have done this, who've been in the industry for years to come, right? Who've veterans from big pharma, et cetera, right? And, you know, you get left as founders with, you know, small percentages, less than 5% of the company. Then there's the West Coast model where you have a lot of money flowing in from various VCs, various uh, incubators and so on that take chances on new founders like Marco and myself, right? Who are building these biotech companies. So one of the things you will have to decide as a founder is like, okay, right? Do I would go the indie bio route, right? Where it's proven track, where it's, you know, or sky deck where, you know, th they'll bring a lot of value to me. Or do I take a very different route with these accelerators like Y Combinator, who, ha who doesn't have a lot of biotech experience, right? But, but, but they do have an engine to help you propel you to that next level. So it's trade-offs that you have to make as founders. There's no right or wrong reason. You have to make the right decision for you at that time. Um, but, but keep that in mind that there's different models of how to build a biotech company. And all these accelerators are, are trying to help in, in, in their own ways. Thank you for that plug-in, Gio. I think one of the biggest lessons from this conversation here is like, you know, you're going to have <laughs> options when you go into your incubator or an accelerator. Again, going back to the first point, write down what your needs are. Yeah. Number two, talk to founders like Marco and Gio, and there are plenty of them who have gone through the program. So, you know, you'll be amazed at how many people are open to talk to you just to give advice. So do talk to them and then decide. And, and the biggest, biggest takeaway is like deep tech, science takes a lot of time to get to a data point and VC money is like rocket fuel and you need to be getting data out like so fast. Okay. So be very careful where you take money from. And, you know, life is a lot of disappointments. You don't want to add one more knowingly or unknowingly, but talk to people. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I think we have our next guest, Darren Cook. Uh, He's here, right? Let me take your anything. Thank you so much, Marco, for that beautiful talk and for answering all those questions. And uh, congratulations on that. And so here we have a uh, second speaker, Darren Cook, uh, who's going to talk about his, uh, yeah, he's going to share his expertise on uh, taking the idea from the lab to the, to the, to the market. Yeah. Thank you so much, Darren, for joining. And yeah, uh, of course. Happy. Thanks, Naresh and Tree for inviting me. I'm the currently the executive director of the Life Sciences Entrepreneurship Center at UC Berkeley. This is a center that's been around for all of uh, nine months at this point. It used to run the BioTrack at Skydeck, the, the startup accelerator downtown. Started that with QB3 back in 2018 and uh, chaired it for seven cohorts. So, but a bit more about me. Way back in time, I actually was an engineer at UCSF working in cochlear implants and a grad student at Berkeley in Tony Keaveny's orthopedic biomechanics lab threw that straight out the window to go to law school. So I went to law school, graduated from Columbia in 1999, was a patent litigator for a bunch of years, ran an IP department at a research tools company for 10 years. 2015, started my own tiny uh, IP law practice because I wanted to focus on working with startups. I was intrigued by working with them ultimately started investing in these, ultimately 
found myself chairing the med device and digital health side of Life Science Angels, which is a large seed stage investment group in Silicon Valley. As mentioned, started the, the BioTrack at Skydeck, the startup accelerator downtown Berkeley, ran that for seven cohorts. The reason I'm actually here today is to tell you this is about how to tell if your idea is a good one and you want to commercialize it, is that I've been teaching this program called the ICOR program run by the NSF and the NIH since 2017. That program is 100% about testing your idea for commercial, commercial viability. It applies to everybody here who thinks that they might have a startup. Along those lines, I am a lecturer at Berkeley Haas. I teach the launch startup uh, accelerator program, an MBA course in the fall, and a bunch of other stuff. So let me jump right in. Oh, wait. But today, the Life Sciences Entrepreneurship Center, or what we call LSEC, is what I'm doing 100% of the time. Right. In chat, this is, I told you, this is going to be interactive. How about a guess? What, what percentage of startups don't make it? They start up, and then they don't they don't succeed. 95%, 80%, 95%. Yeah, it's funny, it's kind of a trick question because I thought, oh, I'll just Google this and figure out the number. And I mean, the truth is out there, right? No, the truth is actually really difficult to ascertain because it's hard to get, it's hard to understand what's a startup and what's failure, frankly. But most people say 90%, right? Nine out of 10. I heard somebody recently said 19 out of 20, which I thought was very specific, but yeah, nine out of 10, right? Nine out of 10. What's going on with the 10% that make it? This, we actually have pretty good stats on, right? The question about what's actually causing them to fail is because once you have a failed startup, you can just go ask people like, well, what, what happened? And luckily people have done that. CB Insights went back and did 101 postmortems on failed startups. And this is what they came up with. Anything shocking here? Yeah, number one, this is, these are interviews with the CEOs themselves saying like, well, what went wrong, right? In all, all spaces, this is not just life sciences, but in all spaces, no market need. Wow, self, they're admitting this. They were building something that not enough people wanted to buy. 29%, almost 30, oh, three out of 10 ran out of cash, which is also code for what? And frankly, no market need. Investors weren't on board. Customers weren't, weren't on board. And there's other legitimate reasons that companies don't make it. But overwhelmingly, what people are doing is they're building something. They're starting a startup to sell something that not enough people want to buy. Let's look at some examples. How about a subscription watch service? For 140 bucks a month, get a different watch every month. You predict what happened with this? Yeah, I ran out of money, right? Not enough people wanted it. Some people wanted it. I've taught this class for years now where there's always someone in the room who's like, I'd, I'd subscribe, but it's always one person out of 50, right? There's not enough people who think that this is a good idea. <laughs> the hypersensitive smoke alarm, one of my favorite, because the, the copy on the website was so earnest. It said, you know, in a house fire, every second counts, which is indisputably true. Right, every second counts if your house is on fire. We get that. Enough people wanting to replace their existing smoke alarm with something super sensitive, for various reasons, no. Yeah, not enough people. It ran out of money, and you're probably thinking, well, those are silly, right? You're not. None of you have these ideas, and you're not going to try to commercialize like a watch subscription program. But what about this? The cure for cancer treatment. Wait, what is this? Oh, this is a platform that connects cancer patients with clinical trials and experimental therapies. Well, that sounds kind of important, right? That sounds like something that people actually need. We all sort of intuitively know that this is a big deal. And a lot of people agreed, this is a big deal. They raised $90 million, including from Lee ka -Shing, and ran with it. Two and a half years in development, big launch by a smart guy who should know what he's doing. He's the CEO. He was the CEO of this company, Harvard Medical School, Rhodes Scholarship, was faculty at a cancer center in New York. This guy knows cancer, right? Did he promote it? He sure did. The war on cancer, there was an app for that, including in Canada, if you squint, 
he was all over the place. You can predict, right, based on what I've already been telling you. What happened? Yeah, it ran out of money. Ran out of $90 million is what it ran out of. $90 million, high-profile startup shuts down. What the heck happened there? Right? The problem is it wasn't actually making money. Right? It was a great idea that people intuitively knew was solving a problem that people had, but it wasn't solving a problem for somebody with money to pay for it. That they had these cancer center relationships. None of the hospitals was paying driver as part of the relationship. And it never finalized the deals with other business, insurers, employers, drug companies, those who had money, because they didn't care enough to pay for it, right? So cure for cancer, shut down, ran out of money, November, 2018. All right, so we're gonna take it. I'm trust me, I'm getting to the point where you're gonna assess whether your idea is a good one. I wanna give you a bit of a sidetrack, just my conception of what a great investor pitch is because it will frame the rest of the discussion. All right, so let's think about this. And I said, this is an investor pitch. It's not necessarily, it could be an, a pitch to, uh, your collaborators, it could be a pitch to somebody that you want to get on board and partner with you or future employees, or crucially, this could be a pitch to yourself, right? Are you doing something that's worthwhile to do? Or maybe your spouse who doesn't think that you're spending your time wisely. Right? So this is my framework. And I came up with this. Uh, the, my investment group was asked to do five meetings with companies, or, or we went to a, a conference where we had five spots that were open. And so we said, sure, we'll meet with five companies. A hundred applied to meet with us. Basically me, I was the person who was supposed to go to the conference. So I suddenly found myself in the position where I had to look at a hundred pitch decks all in one day and pick the five I thought I wanted to meet with. And after I did that, I went back and thought, well, what was it about the five that I decided those are the companies that I should meet with? It's distilled here in the next 10 slides. Right, and the first five are the makers and breakers. Number one, a great pitch will start with the problem, no matter what. You're not gonna start with your team, don't start with your IP, don't start with the tech, frame it for us because whoever you're addressing is probably just moving on from something else. What's the problem? Even if it's obvious, just, to, just tell us, what's the problem? And then what's the scope of it? that it's huge, right? It's a huge number of patients. It's a huge geographical scope. There's a bunch of money involved, whatever it is. A problem, and it's a huge problem. Number three, and I know this sounds obvious, right? But you wouldn't believe how many companies don't do this. Number three, you fix the problem, right? Whatever your technology is, is solving it, solving that huge, huge problem. Prove it to us. On this point, I use the skeptical colleague test. You know how everyone has a friend of me that you work with who maybe she's a little bit jealous and doesn't want to think that you've actually succeeded at something. If you could convince her that your solution has solved that huge problem, that's the same level of proof that you want to deliver to investors or really to anyone who's skeptical. But investors are professional skeptics, right? We need to turn down 99% of the pitches that we see. So we're on the lookout for like how to say no. So yeah, convince us. And that it's exceptional. It's 10 times better than anything that people have come up with in the past, right? Why 10 times better? Because already, you know what? If it's a huge problem, people are working on it. People are probably out ahead of you. The incumbents are working in their R&D labs on some other solutions to it. You need to leapfrog them. So we want to see not only that it's a great solution, it's that it's an exceptional solution. And then five, the hardest of all to figure out. And this is where Driver got tripped up. It's irresistible to somebody who's going to buy it from you at a profit, right? Somebody has money and they want the solution so much, they're going to give you the money. That's what we need to see. All right. If you can't prove the first five, then it doesn't matter. And wait, I didn't even say anything about IP or team. Wait, isn't that part of a pitch? It is part of a pitch. But if the first five aren't nailed, the rest doesn't matter, frankly. And yes, indeed, the team. The team is important. Right? You got a team that knows how to execute on this. The revenues are going to be amazing. The IP involved gives you a competitive advantage and you're locking out uh, would-be competitors, freedom to operate, 
looking at third party patents to make sure you're not tripped up on someone else's IP. In a classic investor pitch, you can have a, a, an ask, right? That you're asking for a certain investment. That investment is going to take you to some exciting milestone that will get other investors excited. Uh, it's going to take you somewhere important. And then finally, because investors are in it to make money, remind them of the great exits that have been in the space. But there's a history of, of other VCs making money off a deal similar to yours. So the comps and multiples and stuff just to remind folks. All right, so we review makers and breakers and the value changers. Problem, huge problem, irresistible to someone who's going to buy it at a profit. But how do you prove this to, how do you prove this to an investor or a partner or anybody that you're trying to convince that you're on the right track? Aha, this is where customer discovery comes in. Customer discovery, and this is about to do a deeper dive. This is the mechanism to assess whether your idea is a good one and it's worth commercializing. I'm gonna pause here just because everyone, just like you're, if you're like me in 2017, you thought you knew what customer discovery meant because it sounds like customers, it's logical, right? Customers are people who buy products and discovery is finding them, finding people to buy your product. Unfortunately, no. The person who came up with and coined the term actually means something different. In this context, customers, anyone who can affect whether your solution is adopted. So it can even include your competitors, saboteurs, anybody, just anyone in your ecosystem. And discovery isn't actually finding them. You should be able to find who these people are. It's understanding them. That's the key. So customer discovery uh, made popular by a uh, uh, Inc, a lecturer at Berkeley and Stanford named Steve Blank. He came up with this 100 interview model, which he called the lean startup methodology or customer discovery methodology. Pair this with the business model canvas. Many of you have probably seen this. It's one piece, one page, nine boxes on it. You've got something called the lean launchpad curriculum. And Steve Blank started teaching the lean launchpad curriculum at Berkeley and Stanford. He still does teach it at Berkeley and at Stanford every, every spring using the 100 interview model and the, the, uh, the nine box business model canvas. In 2012, right after this launched, the NSF got wind of this and adopted this program completely. Every, every bit of it has been adapted for what's now called the NSF's i program, also the NIH's i program. So when you hear Lean Launchpad, Lean Startup, i they're not just similar, they're actually the same thing. So it's the same curriculum, it's the same 100 interview model and the same outcomes. So, but what's on right here? Customer discovery, that's what you're doing in the program like this, but not tech interviews. What do I mean by not tech interviews? Like, don't you wanna go out and talk to people about the technology that you've got, that you've come up with and see if they like it or not? No, actually, this is the most counterintuitive part about the entire i program and curriculum. The customers don't care about the tech, right? They don't care about how you did it. They don't care about the details behind the technology. They only care about their problems and needs. And that's all you care about in this process is understanding their problems and needs, not their reaction to your technology. Number one, hardest thing to get teams to shake when they're doing a program like this. All right, so we review. Not about finding customers, as I mentioned, it's understanding every member of your stakeholder ecosystem, wants, needs, must have pain points. And how do you do it? Well, it's deceptively simple. You actually just go out and find them and talk to them. You go and talk to people, not leading with your technology, but just understanding who they are and what their problems are and what they risk they had and what they've bought in the past and figure out based on those conversations, at least a hundred of them, if you're onto something. All right, so if this is intriguing, we have two opportunities to put this methodology, the curriculum into practice near term. So I teach the i program as mentioned. Point of clarification here, there's, there's a short version of it, which is over the course of eight days. It's, the next one will be March 21st through 28th. It's in the evening and it's online. This is the 
way you get into the longer version or called the national i -Corps program which actually comes with grant money it's over the course of seven weeks you do 100 interviews the short version we do 15 interviews but the curriculum is the same thing i taught this i -Corps at lsec lsec is my new center this is life sciences only two times in the last six months <clears throat> last september and last november december Marco did ICOR, indeed. He says it's great. But look at the teams that did it recently. So we had eight teams last September, a few from Berkeley, but Santa Cruz, Davis, UCSF, Irvine, Stanford. The weirdest was that suddenly, I don't know where this Yale team came from, but if you're doing the math, this is a 6 to 9 p.m. class, but right? it's in the evening, our time. The Yale team, first of all, had a faculty member on it. He wanted to do it. Like, wait, you guys, you know, it's going to be late, right? It's going to be nine to midnight your time. And they did it anyway, right? So really engaged with it. The last December, six teams over the course of eight days, five business days, basically 100 and 111 cold customer discovery interviews uh, in all sorts of different areas that you can see here. So including... Uh, I don't think Marco ever took the, uh, the one week course that I taught, but you can see where the folks are coming from. If you're interested in this, a bunch of more information at lsec.berkeley.edu uh, slash i -Corps. There's an FAQ on that page. There's a link to be able to apply. Applications are due. I should have put it on the slide, but the applications are due for the next session, the one starting March 21st. They're due on March 4th. So if interested, reach out to me, darren.cook at berkeley.edu, or uh, just go to the website. Happy to tell you more about it. This is straight from Rhonda Schrader. She is running a startup, a class called Startup Disco on March 11th through 13th. And at this point, I've almost exhausted my knowledge about what this is about. You would think I have been involved with Rhonda in the past in this, but I sadly have not. I can tell you what the bullets say, but you probably can read it just as well as I can. I understand it's over the course of one weekend. It uses customer discovery practices. You team up with a Haas student if you're a science person or vice versa. Uh, and it's a really intensive, popular weekend. So any information about this, all I got was this slide from Rhonda. I gather she's inviting you to reach out if you're interested in participating, reach out to her at this email, Rhonda underscore Schrader at berkeley.edu. She's the executive director of the Berkeley Haas Entrepreneurship Program, BHEP. So with that, Naresh, Sri, I was going to pause. I have a whole other condensed lecture on how to do customer discovery, but I didn't know what people would be interested in. I'll just say, how, if you really want to know how to do customer discovery, sign up for the i class and take it and have that experience. So just watching a lecture about how to do it is sort of like watching a lecture about how to swim. You know, you sort of have to do it to actually understand it. So I'm happy to answer questions at this point or discuss any of this. Or if people are really interested to hear what um, a condensed version of my best practices for actually how to, how to do what I just told you about. I'm happy to go through that too. Yeah, questions, yes. I have a question. Um, I'm Mauro, I'm a uh, pediatric neurology graduate uh, resident from UCSF and now a critical care fellow. Um, and I'm just wondering who, you know, who are you interviewing or who is interviewing you Mm -hmm. uh, when you're taking ICOR, yeah. So it depends on what your technology is, and this 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 process really does work for any type of technology, including for therapeutics. Believe it or not, uh, who you're interviewing over the course of either 15 or 100 interviews. First of all, you brainstorm it with your team. We have an exercise where you think about the whole ecosystem, and that usually jogs your 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 brain basically to figure out who you could who you could talk to. But the short answer is it's anyone, anyone who could affect whether your solution is adopted, anyone who has any influence on the commercialization, the commercial commercializability 
of your idea, they're fair game. So counterintuitively, this also includes, like I said before, people who are competitors or saboteurs or people who are hurt by it, and even government bodies and regulators, payers, buying committees at hospitals, depending on what your technology is, those are people who you're going to form hypotheses about what their problems are, what their pain points are, and then go track them down and talk to them, find out if you're right. Crucially, no team has ever been right. This is one of those things. You go into it and you're like, I'm certain I know what this is going to be like. And every time, every team is at least a little bit wrong. And that's the beauty of it. So the more interviews you do, the more right you become. So quick story. I did, I did 150 customer discovery interviews when setting up Berkeley LSEC. You know, I'd, I'd worked at, uh, in the ecosystem for years, teaching the i class and chairing the, the bio track at Skydeck. You know, I should know what the issues are for people who are trying to commercialize life science innovations out of academic labs. Well, I went ahead and did 150 customer discovery interviews. I found tons of surprises bunch of white space that wasn't addressed, bunch of ideas that we could, uh, we could approach and try to fix. So it works just consistently in almost every endeavor. I guess uh, sort of the follow-up question is that when you are talking to competitors and reaching out to them, to what extent do you or should you reveal the fact that you're working on something that could potentially edge them out? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a tricky one. With competitors, you typically don't tell them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you. I mean, you don't. You don't want to be sleazy or sneaky about it, but you typically wouldn't tell them. The, so you the just, trick. Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. You just learn from them and leave it at that. The tricky part is, and this is, I'm sort of jumping ahead to what's in the slides to come. If you wanted to see them, consistently, what happens when you're reaching out to somebody and, and you actually meet with somebody? And they're smart people and you're a nice person, right? And they're nice people. 99% of people are actually just really interested in helping you. And so you've reached out to them. They're the expert and you go talk to them. And the first thing they say is, well, why don't you tell me all about what you're doing, right? What a great trap to, to fall into because you want to tell them, right? You're like, oh yeah, you know what? Let me tell you about this. It's so exciting. And then the rest of the conversation becomes about you and your idea. And you miss the opportunity to learn from them and their expertise. And odds are, you'll be so excited about your idea. They'll be excited about your idea just because that's the way you lead a witness, right? That's, the, that's what happens. And so teams come back in the, in the program and will report, you know, I talked to this guy and he loved it. You know, I'm so excited about it. And the role of the teaching team in the i program is to sort of beat that out of the teams. Say, yeah, you know what? That's not the, the type of question you should be asking. And not, it's, a, it's exciting to hear it, but that's not the goal of the program. All you're looking for is surprises from talking to the experts. So anyway, I just want to point out, it is fair. The, the way to deflect when somebody says, oh, tell me all about what you're doing, you say, you know what? I would really love to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you at the end of our conversation why I want to learn from you first. The funny thing is, and this happened to me myself, that if you're really fascinated with somebody else's experience and expertise and listening to them and writing down every word that they say, they won't stop talking, right? That's just natural. They'll just keep talking about themselves. And you've many times you'll just run out of time and you never even get to tell them what your idea was. And that's fine too. Jin has a question there. Why NSF and I chose 100 interviews plus Canvas, not any other methodology? Hmm. I don't know. It, um, it, <laughs> I think after Steve Blank taught the class a couple of times at Berkeley and Stanford, and it was, it was proven to be so successful, Errol Arkelich at the NIA, at NSF got wind of it. And uh, the, the way the story goes, literally called Steve Blank on his cell phone, I think, and said, hi, it's the NSF calling. And we'd like to talk to you about this program that you've, you've come up with at Berkeley and Stanford. 
and I want to learn more about it. And then one thing led to another, and it's proven just to be hugely successful. The NSF, I think, has put through 3,000 teams over the course. And I mean, what I mean, full course, seven week, 100 interview teams over the course of the last 10 years. I have a question for you, Darren. Yep. Do you ever take companies a second time through? Because we basically ended up running our own mini i Mm-hmm. because we, we, we realized we got stuck during the funding phase. Yeah. We were, we'd been talking to a ton of people. And we're like, we're clearly missing something. So we'd, we'd gone through the mini i We unfortunately didn't make it through the national one, but we, we'd done a lot of that customer discovery. But I almost wish there was a structured thing for companies to go through once they've already launched, because yeah. there was then there's new learning that you have to get. And that was something that we had to do ourselves. And yeah. I'm just curious if there are any programs for that. Yeah, so we take teams a second time all the time, right? If they come back and they say, you know what, we really want to explore this different market or this different customer segment, or we have a different theory about something, and they were a great team before, we'll take them again. So I think we've actually had one team go through two consecutive months. You know, we teach this course every month at Haas. I teach it once a quarter, the life science version, but we've had a team come through like one month and then got to the end and was so excited. And then they realized they needed to explore something else. They went through the the very next course. So it's possible. Darren, one of the points um, Marco raised earlier was like, you know, early stage founders, they need, if they get $5,000, it means a lot. And then if Mm -hmm. you get like $100,000, it means a lot. Uh, You mentioned about the national phase of the cycle. I think plugging that in in terms of like, if there's any money that comes up uh, with the program, I think that will really be an incentive or a driving factor. A, yeah. a good one, I think, like they're doing customer research. That'd be great. Yeah. So the, the seven week, 100 interview version of the NSF i program does come with a $50,000 grant. It, it comes also with other restrictions that Dave Weiner, who's on the the call here can tell you all about any question. By the way, I should put put this in before. Any questions about anything having to do with ICOR eligibility? Um, and I see he's unmuting. The ability for you to participate in the program. Send those questions to Dave, because what I've consistently found is that my knowledge about the eligibility requirements are like twelve months out of date. <laughs> So, and then and they seem to be changing. And so Dave knows the answers to all these things. But um, Naresh, to answer your question, the, the, the longer format version does come with a $50,000 grant. However, it's to be used only for customer discovery purposes. Meaning typically travel, frankly. So you're able to go and, and meet people face to face. Dave, did you have any plugins there? I, if anyone does have any questions, um, I'm super happy to get into it. But um, yeah, for I mean, I'd say if, if any of this resonates with anyone on the call at all, I would definitely encourage you apply for i do the short course we have at Berkeley, apply for i and LSEC coming up in March, especially. It's a fantastic program. Darren's the best at teaching it. Um, you'll get a lot of learnings in that week. So we're going to do 15 interviews in that week. And then, um, yeah, as long as your technology is sort of uh, developed at the university, um, they're really, the NSF is really looking for teams who sort of have that university roots, who are looking to make a bigger impact just beyond publishing papers with a startup. So if that fits you at all, uh, then the National i program would be a great fit for you. But I'd say um, even that is just like, sort of you'll you'll see where you're at after you do the 15 interviews so if, if any of this might help on your journey just to validate who your customer is or who just the different stakeholders in your ecosystem are uh, the icord lsec course is just a it's just a fantastic experience so um you know everyone here would be uh, encouraged and invited to apply yep definitely great uh i don't know if there are no questions i'll, I'll just plug in one other thing just relevant to this you know, was it a story that you came across, Dave or Darren, one of you, in the deep tech space, either take something like a semiconductor or a therapeutic or a diagnostic that went through the program and they came back with some surprising findings? Like, 
before, oh, yeah. and a- before and after. I think just to set the context, right? Yeah, it happens every time. Yeah. Oh, so I should point out. If, yeah. In the in the in the longer format course, it used to be, uh, after seven weeks, we would ask teams to stand up, and say they were a go or a no go. Who got away from that? But that was that was classically the end of the program. People would stand up in front of a big room. We did it in person. They were go or a no go. Fully half of the teams, there would be 24 teams at once in going through the seven week program, would be a no go. Like these are teams that are serious and they've really come up with something interesting and they do a hundred interviews and they stand up and they're like, I, I think we were wrong. Like we, we don't think there's a market there after all. Here's the thing that's 50 50. The teaching team had their own scorecards because we understood who, who they were interviewing, what their conclusions were, and we scored them go or no go. We had fully three quarters a no go, right? So in our view, half of them were delusional, right? Or a quarter of them were were not reaching the same conclusion that we would have reached. But the rest, your your question, the we had a team from NASA come through, and the, this is actually one of the most striking pivots and exciting pivots that I've seen. They had some. A switch, I think it was a switch for a, for a satellite, right? So it counts as hard tech. <laughs> it was a switch for a satellite, and they were sure that satellite manufacturers really wanted the switch, whatever it was, a relay, I think. And they started talking to people, and I think it was around interview fifty that they came in one one week, and they're like, "Oh my God, we found the biggest issue, and it's not the switch; it's this capacitor thing." And they were so excited. I'm like, "That's." fantastic but does your switch fix the capacitor issue that you just heard about They're like no we're scrapping the switch <laughs> we're scrapping the switch we're going to go back to the lab and fi- figure out this capacitor thing uh and then that's the pushed on through for the, the rest of the program like that awesome thank you for that yeah i'll sort of just second that i don't think i get emails every single time we run the course um, from teams they're just like Thank you so much. Thanks to Darren usually, or sometimes we have other instructors. Um, Darren Darren always does the I-Cord LSAT course, but just like the the learning leaps um, that we realize in these conversations is would have taken us, you know, months, years to have done on our own. Um, so it, yeah, it, you, you never know um, until you really have those discussions and, and like the light bulbs do tend to go off in very unexpected ways as you go. Awesome, thank you. So, so Mauro, I have an, do you yeah, have a I have another. Sorry, I have another question. Um, you know, earlier in the slide, in the slide where you were showing why startups fail, like the, I think the third or fourth thing was that like the people just weren't the right people, you know. And um, I, the, the thing that I've the technology that I've been working on, I've been doing it like completely isolated, and I feel like a, I feel like I'm a content expert in this thing, and now it's a matter of like finding someone else to have on my team. And it's mm-hmm. just like, how do you even go about doing that? You know, like all of the people that I work with in the laboratory environment are like not interested in this space. They think, you know, it's, it's what you describe where you talk to them and they're like, your thing sounds really cool. It sounds awesome. It seems like we really need this. And then, you know, no one else is like, it's like, yeah. okay, like who's in there with me, you know? And then, and you just can't get any traction, you know, because everyone's an academic and wants to just stick to their K and R tracks. Sure. Right. <laughs> so th- it's funny that you mentioned this because the reason that I missed Marco's talk was because I was running a program f- uh, that went from 4.30 to 6.30, a little bit over, called Bio Startup Speed Teaming. <laughs> no kidding. Let me show you what the agenda looked like. It looked like this. So this was not, it was nine 10 minute meetings the people across the top were typically mostly Haas MBA students, other people who um, you know, have some sort of business or technical background. And all the people in the gold were people with startup ideas. And so all they were doing was having meeting after meeting after meeting, 10 minutes at a time, looking for some sort of interesting connection. And so, and I'll tell you, this works. We ran this last October where uh, a, st- a postdoc from LBNL went through the program. He met an MBA student from Haas. 
they decided that you know they had enough overlap and interest in working together. They did the i program together. So Dave, this is Hopo and Julian and Hannah. They did the i program together after meeting in the speed taming event. And I just learned yesterday that they're formally forming the company as co-founders. So, so yes, uh, I'm not, you know, this doesn't happen everywhere. Mauro, you're at UCSF. This is open to Berkeley students. <laughs> so is, is what we're doing here. But, you know, I've heard Marco's story about how he met Gio basically by venturing onto the, the business school part of the campus uh, and taking a class. It's just one of those things where, you know, you put yourself out there and you meet enough people and then, you know, one thing leads to another. You find, find people with similar interests or complementary skills. Yeah, yeah. Get, get, get out of the academic circles. Like it's, it's, timidity is not the right term for it, but, you know, I, I feel like there are enough people that stay in academia because it's the safe path and it's the well-trodden path. And I think, um, it, it, yeah, get, get, get outside of there, put yourself out there. And it's, it is shocking how many amazingly qualified people you run into. And Mara, what we do at BPAP events is also open up for pitch events, like we invite somebody like you, if you have an idea, give a two minute pitch because somebody in the audience might know somebody or they want to talk to you or you know, they'll just give you feedback. You'll need a big team anyways. Uh, it's free. Uh, yeah. If you want to do that now, right now, we can do that or we can wait till the next event and next month, March 17th. I can wait. Thanks. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Naresh, do you wonder why there's a UCSF resident in your meeting? Oh, we invite everybody. This is, this is an open- I know. So I, I just got connected with him today through Rachel ah. Cooperman from EYES. Okay. Um, and she said, you know, this, he's at the right stage to take the i class. Ah. Like, and so this is just over email today. I said, you know what, coincidentally, I'm talking about the i program at 7 p.m. tonight. If you want to sign right. up for this Berkeley lecture. So that's, that's awesome. how, Thank that's how that. that happened. Yeah. But yes, you'll meet awesome people like Marco and others like who have start companies or, you know, people like Darren or people with ideas. Yeah, so if there are any no more questions, then uh, let's thank the speakers, uh, Darren and Marco, for their time and for all their uh, advice. Uh, and um, yeah, hope. So as Naris said that we, we have our next event on March 17th, we're still finalizing the speaker and the topic. So we hope you are all stay, uh, stay tuned to BPEP events in the future. And um, yeah, we'll be announcing and we'll be circulating the newsletter and uh, like the events details in the newsletter very soon. So yeah. Thank you so much again and uh, hope you have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.